on Luke. Uh, we were talk some of us were talking last week that you know when we read the scripture we'll we'll go to Matthew or we'll go to Mark and uh, sometimes uh, in your reading we just don't seem to always get around to Luke. Luke's kind of the third child uh, and the third child gets overlooked, you know but uh, Luke is very important in the way in which he presents <clears throat> the the gospel story of Jesus in relationship to the Old Testament and <clears throat> in the continuation of the work of God in the life, early life of the church. And so there's a number of things that we want to see as we work through Luke. There are unique uh, presentations that Luke gives us, unique insights into the story of Jesus. And one of those is the interesting information that comes only in Luke about the 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 beginning of this with the the um, with John the Baptist and with Jesus and what we call here, as you can see on the screen, the infancy narratives. That is this long narrative of how it is that uh, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus took place. And uh, there are a lot of things to see in here. And so we're going to pray and jump into our work this morning. Father, thank you for the Gospel of Luke. Thank you for the teaching that it gives us about the Lord Jesus and all of the miraculous things that were done and the revelation of the hope and the blessings of salvation in Christ. So, Lord, Guide us as we again open the scripture together today and uh, grant us insight into your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus and John, the infancy narratives, and this, this is a very long account. <clears throat> I'm glad, actually, that we have the opportunity to study this outside of Christmas, because when Christmas comes, and we have looked We've looked in this uh, in this class uh, in in the context of a Christmas focus and Christmas theme, but there is so much here that one cannot unpack it all in the time that uh, we have when we give our attention to Christmas. This is not just a, a one Sunday morning or even a couple of them because there is so much detail that is here. In these infancy narratives, there, there, are, there, there are three, depending on how we go here, we could break it down into four parts. But this first part is the miraculous conception of John, and we're talking here about John the Baptist. So let's see what we have here. The setting is given to us in Luke 1. Verses five through seven, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years." Interesting in this setting, it puts it into um, political history right at the beginning. In, it's in the days or during the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Judea, when we when just a few weeks ago, we were in Malachi. <clears throat> we traced our way through the Persian era of Old Testament history coming from Ezra all the way to Malachi, which took us from the uh, reign of Cyrus the Persian, that's the beginning of the Persian Empire, all the way down to Artaxerxes I, who was the king at the time of Nehemiah. And uh, that also put us in the context for Malachi. Malachi's prophecy was right there, and that's where the Old Testament ends. And then you move about 400 years all the way to the beginning where we are here in, in history. And uh, where we find ourselves now is that Rome is exercising hegemony, not Persia. 
Uh, Caesar Augustus is the emperor, and Herod is the king over Judea, plus uh, some of the surrounding territory. Judea has been, at this time, under a, under a king, quote-unquote, by that expressed title for over 100 years. Uh, it began in the what we call the Hasmonean Kingdom, <clears throat> which were the descendants of Judas Maccabeus, who, who um, led the what we call the Maccabean Revolt against the Greeks who had uh, desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, eventually one of them took the title king <clears throat> and his successors were called kings all the way down to Herod. Herod was not one of the Maccabeans. He was a very... Um, astute politician with respect to Rome. Uh, his father uh, was well known to the Caesar and uh, worked to get his son into power. <clears throat> Herod was a was early supporter of Mark Anthony when they had that civil war after Julius Caesar was assassinated, you know. And uh, and he was commissioned by Anthony, by Mark Anthony, to be the king of Judea. And the Roman Senate conferred it upon him uh, in 40 BC. But uh, that, that war changed and uh, the, the, um, the advantage went to Octavian. And so Herod switched his strategically allegiance to Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus. So Herod ends up on the right side of political developments, and in 37 BC, he begins to reign as king. We are here about 5 BC, so we're close to the end of Herod's reign. We know after Jesus' birth, we know from um, uh, further on in the story, especially in, in Matthew, how um, uh, Joseph had to take Mary and Jesus away from Herod's reach to try to kill the child. And then shortly thereafter, Herod died. So we're toward the end of the reign of Herod, and there is so much going on. It's a very interesting time politically, but Luke really doesn't spend any time there. He just mentions it. It was during those days of Herod the king. And then we get on to what's really important. <laughs> and we move on to be introduced to a priest by the name of Zechariah. We're told that he's of the division of Abijah. We know from First Chronicles there were 24 divisions of, of priests. Remember, uh, priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. priests. Priests are a group of the Levites who particularly service the temple, right? And uh, in 1 Chronicles, David organized when, the, when he gave the plans for the temple. His, Solomon built the temple, but David developed the plans for it and raised the money for it and commissioned his son to build it. <laughs> so, so Solomon did build it, but one of the things David did was to organize the priesthood to service the temple, and they created 24 divisions of priests with family heads of each of those divisions. In Nehemiah, when we were in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 12, where Nehemiah is talking about how, you know, he's getting the priest back, you know, the temple has been built, rebuilt in Jerusalem, and, and they're making sure that all the service is proceeding correctly. He names the heads of the 24 divisions of the priests. Well, Abijah was the eighth division, and Zechariah belongs to that division. We know that at this time, there were a lot of priests. There were about 750 of them per division, which means that for 24 divisions, you have about 18,000 priests. Now, that's a lot of them, all right? And their job is to service the temple. On the big holy days, uh, like the Passover or Pentecost or Feast of Booths or this sort of thing, 
They're all on duty. It's all hands on duty, servicing the temple and all around in Jerusalem. But otherwise, <clears throat> these priests, um, their job was to serve for one week in the temple twice a year. They would live, a lot of them lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city of priests, okay? But a lot of them also lived in the surrounding area. We know a lot of them lived down in Jericho. Uh, we know from the further story here that Zechariah and Elizabeth lived uh, what they called the hill country, <laughs> which was just outside of Jerusalem to the, to the uh, west and uh, somewhat to the north. So that, that hilly area, he, he lived, they lived out there. Now, what do they do? Well, they, they would sometimes engage in whatever business or farming or whatever they would do, except for the time when they were on duty in the temple. So this was his opportunity um, to be there at the temple. So we're talking about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, priests, you know, had to marry other Israelites, but it was particularly advantage, advantageous if the priest could marry um, a woman who was also a descendant of priestly family, and Elizabeth was. <laughs> Zechariah, by the way, means that God remembers. It's the name, what the name means. Elizabeth, or the Hebrew is Elisheba. Uh, we're not sure exactly what it means. The possibility is God is, is uh, favorable or something like this. But at any rate, uh, this is a priestly family, and they, they were both righteous before God, which is interesting to hear that from the New Testament, because we, we know, we go to Paul, and we think of Romans 3, where there's no one who's righteous before God. So how is it that they're righteous before God? Well, Paul also said in Philippians 3, that when, uh, before he met Jesus, that he was righteous. Uh, according to the law. He was blameless according to the law. So what we're talking about here is a kind of a, an external um, conscience, conscious obedience to the law, which is primarily for these Pharisees ritualistic. So they're doing everything they know that the law requires. Uh, but it's not the same as the deep righteousness that Jesus revealed. So we get into Sermon on the Mount where he says, you heard it was said, but this is what I'm telling you. How deep does this righteousness go? And when we start looking at it in that kind of depth, then we realize uh, that we're not righteous. It's the same with Job in Job 1.1. When we we're studying Job, we saw that it says he's a righteous man. He's blameless before God. And we read about his character and so on. But then um, a little bit later, uh, and Job uh, four, uh, Job nine verse two, Job uh, says, "Can any man be righteous before God?" So the text says he was righteous before God, but he himself says, "How can anybody be righteous before God?" So <clears throat> keep that in mind when you hear this. Uh, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. What's interesting here, we're, we're, you know, we're very much used to scripture and so on. Um, commentators will point out that the, the way this is written uh, fits exactly with Old Testament style. The phrase, during the days of Herod, the king of Judea, is a is a um, is a biblical rhetorical style. You don't find it in the secular literature of the time. You don't find it in Greek literature. That way of saying that, uh, and you're introduced to a couple who are old, righteous, and without child. And immediately, since you know the story of the Bible, 
you recognize the type. You're supposed to think, uh, let's see, I heard about that with Abraham and Sarah. You know, I heard about that with uh, Jacob and Rachel. You know, I heard about that. And so you immediately sense something that's similar in the narrative and you expect <laughs> that that the way this story usually proceeds is that a child is going to be involved in this all right all of that is intentional because it res the point is you create this literary resonance and what it's telling you is you're in the story of the bible okay this is this is uh, fitting according to the ways of God. Remember, uh, one of the things that Moses or the Lord told Moses is that he would reveal his ways, the way he does things to him. And so the way in which God does things is coming through. Now, we read here um, the revelation of Zach to Zechariah in the temple. Uh, Zechariah is given a priestly assignment, Luke 1, 8 to 9. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. With 18,000 priests, they had to make some kind of rules. And the rule at this time is you get to do this once in your life. Okay. Now, you know, they got to share this privilege. So, you know, if you're chosen, you can't have done it before. So this is Zachariah's chance of a lifetime. Uh, he's going to be able to go in there and offer the incense uh, in the temple of the Lord. So... Um, he would offer this incense on the altar of incense, which sits in the holy place. Remember how the temple is divided. You have the innermost part of the temple is a square. It's actually a cube. It's the holy of holies. And then you have the, the chamber that precedes that is the holy place. So you have the holy place and you have the holy of holies. And then you go out of the temple. So when you enter it, you enter the holy pl place. Only the priest can go into the holy place. And this is where Zechariah goes. He goes into the holy place to the altar of incense to offer the incense on the altar. The altar is a gold-plated altar that's a cubit square in terms of the surface on the top. So... You've got a cubit is about one and a half feet. So you've got over two feet square on the top. It's not a big piece of furniture, all right? And it's two cubits high. So you've got um you've got about 36 inches or so. The cubits, this is not exact, you know, it slightly changes a little bit in history, but so somewhere around. 36 to 40 inches high. And then you got a, about a two foot platform. You can see in the, the uh, image on the screen, that's probably pretty close. So he would go and he would offer the incense there. And that thing sits right in front of the curtain that closes off the Holy of Holies. And into that area, only the high priest can go once a year. Otherwise, no one is allowed in there. Now, <clears throat> he would, uh, remember, he's never done this before. And at this time, whoever does it has never done it before. So I would imagine that there's probably some kind of coaching, some kind of instruction before you do it. I mean, you know, this is what we typically do, right? So you would have, um, you know, he would meet with maybe the priest who's over 
the arrangements or whatever and and go through how to do this. And the others who have done it would have contributed their wisdom. Now, this is what you do, okay? You go in there and he would take the fire pan. Usually there was another priest who would accompany with the fire pan and he would take the incense. They put the fire and the incense on the altar and then he would prostrate himself in front of it and then he would withdraw. And then he comes out and he pronounces a blessing on the people who are gathered outside. And I would imagine, you know, him being instructed, this is not difficult. You just, just need to do this. Don't drop stuff on your way in there, you know, and stuff like this, you know, just get it done, you know. All right. So he's going to offer this incense. This is happening at the time <clears throat> that people are praying outside. It says the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. There are two times a day this is done. In the morning, right at dawn, and in the evening, right at dusk. And this is probably the evening. Luke doesn't tell us which one it is. Is this the morning sacrifice or is this the evening sacrifice? It's probably the evening because there was a whole multitude of people who probably were not there at dawn. Okay, But we don't know. They're probably not. We know uh, from other sources that in the evening time, they timed it so that the the incense would be offered on the altar of incense at the exact time that the people go to pray outside. Because the incense is supposed to symbolize the prayers that are going up to the Lord. Okay. So it's probably at that time, the time of the evening sacrifice. And why is that important? Well, we'll, we'll see in a little bit. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. I would think that at this moment, uh, what for all of his training, he knows this is not usual. All right. Nobody said anything about an angel being in there. Okay. <laughs> And they also would have had lots of instructions about what you don't do when you go in there. You know, you don't, you don't manage to wander into the Holy of Holies. You, you know, you have to conduct there. Everything has to be done right. And nobody said anything about an angel appearing. <clears throat> so here's this guy who's concentrating on doing it right. And lo and behold, <clears throat> An angel is standing there. He's also told about, you know, the, the way in which God will punish uh, those who break the law regarding how these things are supposed to happen. And so fear is understandable, number one, for being surprised by the unexpected, number two, <clears throat> A, an angel of God being in there might indicate that he's in trouble. And so uh, he's definitely started, startled. And then the angel speaks. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. He calls him by name. That's the interesting thing. Now, he's never met this angel before. Obviously, we know God knows who we are, okay? But it is startling to have an angel appear who speaks to you by your name, right? Don't be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. It's interesting, this second line, for your prayer has been heard. We know from what has just been told us that Zechariah and Elizabeth are advanced in age, and Zechariah is going to point that out here in a little bit. 
But um, since that is the case, it would seem likely that this is not a current prayer. it's more likely that this was something that they had been praying at one time rather fervently. And perhaps they came to the resolution that, well, this is just not what God is going to do. And so they just have to leave this matter, just leave it with God. So here he's been being told your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. I think it must be just a little bit shocking to be told this at this time, uh, this prayer that had certainly been on the prayer list, but probably has been not voiced recently. You will call his name John, which means the Lord is gracious. Zachariah, the Lord remembers John, the Lord is gracious. And you will have joy and gladness. Another way to translate that is that he will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice at his birth. This is really, <laughs> you can imagine the joy and delight. And we're going to see this, you know, as the narrative goes on, but you know, you know, at this age, having grandchildren is a joy and delight, but they you know, have no possibility of the grandchildren because they don't have any children. So this excitement and this fun that they're going to have is just amazing. It is a blessing of God. And many are going to rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. For he will be great before the Lord. Now, this is a priest, Zechariah. And where does he serve? Before the Lord. They all serve before the Lord. When they go into the temple, they're serving before the Lord. It may sound just with that line that he's going to be a great priest. He must not drink wine or strong drink. Priests were not allowed to drink wine or strong drink when they were on duty. Nazarites could not drink wine or strong drink ever because they were, for their whole lifetime, holy to the Lord. That was Samson was a Nazarite and so on. Some have suggested this is what the angel is saying, that John will be a Nazarite, but that's not the case. It doesn't seem that they're, they're not the other things about Nazarites that are mentioned here. Rather, the reason for his not drinking wine or strong drink is because he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. A point that the narrative is going to make when Mary comes to Elizabeth and we have that reaction from the baby in her womb. He is uniquely filled with the Holy Spirit through his life. And scripture contrasts that very interestingly in the, in the New Testament. Remember in Acts 2, when they were all filled with the Spirit and they were speaking in Acts 2 and the people came out and thought they were drunk, right? But Peter had told him that's not the case. Rather, this is a working of the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5, Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit in the way you sing and speak. So it seems that the focus here is on the manifestation of the Spirit in terms of speaking and, and rejoicing and worshiping to the Lord. The reason for the restriction here is that this person and what he says <clears throat> is all an instrument of the Holy Spirit and consequently that mind is not to be clouded, is not to be intoxicated. The Spirit in using the vessel like this is using 
full mental capacity in the instrument of God. So, hence the restriction. And then the angel says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. This is interesting because uh, you would most likely remember some of the phrasing of this because it's taken from Malachi. We were just recently in Malachi. And Malachi 3.1 read this way, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And then in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. The the words that are in, are, are in yellow there and underlined are the words that are taken from this prophecy and repeated by the angel to Zechariah. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. That actually goes back to Malachi 2, uh, verse 6, where in Malachi, he says the job of a priest is to turn the people to the Lord. So the, then, and in Malachi's day, the priests were not doing that. And so they got rebuked because this is what they're supposed to do. Well, <clears throat> this one, the, who, John, is going to turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And that turn is also taken up in the Elijah prophecy, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. But then he says, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts, to make ready a people uh, for the Lord of people prepared. Now look here, look at Elijah, look at Malachi 3.1. That's the first two lines on the screen. See the word prepare and the word before. And then you see the Elijah prophecy. It's not clear in Malachi these two go together. Okay. But look how, look how the angel speaks here. Notice where before is, verse 17, he will go before him. Now look for the word prepared. It's at the end, okay, to make ready for the people, for the Lord of people prepared. So what's in Malachi together, prepare the way before me, gets split and sandwiched in between is the Elijah prophecy, telling you that that prophecy is applying to the same person that is going to prepare the way before the Lord. And also, there's interesting things that are happening here. He will go before him, verse 17, the him, it looks back to the previous line, the Lord God. Now, we know how the narrative proceeds, right? John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus. What is the angel telling you? Who is Jesus? This is Luke's way of pointing out that this is the Lord, God himself, okay? And also... <clears throat> The last line, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So this is the coming of God, which Malachi also is saying. We're presented with the coming of Jesus, whom the gospel reveals is God the Son. So there's, there's a, in the revelation, there's a complex... <laughs> revelation of the meaning of the prophecy. But what's also interesting is that the Elijah prophecy applies, and yet not quite. You see that phrase, in the spirit and power of Elijah? That's not quite this, I will send you Elijah. But John is going to go in the spirit and power of Elijah. 
So that's going to set you up then in the Gospels with the disciples asking Jesus, why are they saying that Elijah is going to come? And this is a conversation that happened at the Mount of Transfiguration, where Elijah appears along with Moses talking with Jesus. And Jesus says, Elijah is going to come. But he says, if you're willing to accept it, he's already come. And they did to him what they wanted to do. And he was talking about John the Baptist. And the text says they all knew he was talking about John the Baptist. So John is going to come and fulfill an Elijah-type role, but he's not the complete fulfillment of the Elijah prophecy, which comes back to a point in our little discussion of hermeneutics, when we're talking about the hermeneutics of prophecy, that there is this phenomena in biblical prophecy, which I call complexification. Here's an example of it right here. So if you're just reading Malachi, you think, well, this is simple. The way this is going to be fulfilled is God comes and Elijah comes right before him. Yes, but the way it's being fulfilled is a, is a form, a patterned form of that when God comes, but it's God the Son who is going to make, uh, who actually comes in a more complex way because he comes to go to the cross and he is yet to come in glory. And when he comes in glory, then he makes possible a revelation of the father that is yet to take place. So what, when Malachi is speaking of the coming of God, the way that's fulfilled is a, in a, a complex unfolding pattern of events. And the Elijah prophecy is going to be fulfilled, but we've got someone coming in the spirit and power first. So it's very interesting how all this is happening here. Now, Zechariah responds to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Uh, this is interesting. First of all, Zechariah knew the scripture. So he knew that this kind of thing had happened. It doesn't happen all the time, like once in centuries <laughs> in the plan and purpose of God, but it can happen. So when he says, how shall I know this? Uh, he's asking a question that's not quite appropriate. Now, Abraham pointed out that he was old to God, but he didn't say, how can I know that what you're saying is true? Some commentators point to various ones who are given signs, but nobody does this. The closest you come to this is Gideon, who when the angel of the Lord appears to him, Gideon asks for a sign. He's given this fleece, right? Okay, that's at the mercy of God that he gives this to him for God's purposes. But when, uh, when Zechariah says, how shall I know this for I'm an old man? I can just imagine a pause right here. You ever, you ever have those times when you say something and you know there's somebody else listening to you or other people and you say something and, and it's like there's this, long pause and during that pause you're realizing that what you just said was stupid <laughs> and and everybody everybody knows that and and you can't take it back because those words are reverberating in front of God and everybody okay I kind of think that that's our situation here I can just imagine Gabriel looking at him after he says this. And, and I kind of th think that because the way Gabriel answers. So see how he answers. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. So it exactly parallels Zachariah's comment, I am an old man. Uh, in Greek, it's ego emi pres presbytes. I'm an old man. Gabriel responds, ego emi Gabriel, I am Gabriel. 
I'm an old man. I am Gabriel. And I'm an old man because I look at myself and I look at my wife. <laughs> Dude, this, this can't happen, you know? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I look at God. Zachariah wants to know, how can I know this? The sign is standing right in front of him. It's an angel talking to him. That's the sign. <laughs> Telling him a message from God. And Gabriel, this is interesting because this he's not identified at first in this. He's just called the angel. But here he's identified by name. He, identi he self-identifies. And we're going to see him uh, next week. Uh, his appearance here is significant in the history of, of Scripture because he's only appeared one time in the whole history of Scripture prior to this by name, and that's in Daniel, which is 500 years earlier than this right here. And uh, so, and Gabriel says, I stand in the presence of God. He's He belongs in God's presence. He's not one of those even that we read about in Job, in Job 1. Remember in Job 1, the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God come and gather for the council in heaven. He's not one of those. He doesn't have to come to the council. He's always there, okay? Uh, we don't, we're not told he's not a seraph. In Isaiah 6, the seraphim cover the face of God and the feet and, and they cover their feet and their faces as they're in front of God and and declaring his holiness. They're always there. Gabriel is an angel in the presence of God, always there. He says, I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring good news to you. And actually, it'd be better if you just don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> and since you can't help it, let me let me take care of that for you. Oh. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. That last phrase, you didn't believe my words will be fulfilled in that time. That's repeated for Mary by Elizabeth, which we'll see later when Elizabeth, who's Zachariah's wife, who had to endure his silence because he didn't believe what was going to be fulfilled. And Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed is she who believed what the Lord said that he was going to fulfill. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. This is this great narrative uh, skill of Luke here. The people were waiting. So you can just imagine they're waiting, you know, because all this is timed. We have a program. You got a copy of the program when you came to the service, okay? And it tells you when these things are supposed to happen. And it's not happening, and he's delayed in there. And so they were wondering what's going on. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he'd seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them. And he remained mute. And what he's supposed to do, he's supposed to come out and do the ironic blessing. The Lord keep you, bless you, and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and give you peace. He's supposed to do that ironic blessing on them. But he's not able to do that. And he can't speak at all. And it's possible the word mute here can also mean that he's deaf. And the possibility of that is because later we're going to find when John is born and, and they ask the question, and Elizabeth said, well, we have to name him John. And they said, no, you don't have to name him that. <laughs> okay. And uh, they go to Zechariah and they have to write it on a tablet. It's possible he was deaf. So he, he's making signs to them and he can't speak. And when the time of the service was ended, he went home. 
And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Why was she hidden? Well, possibly some say to avoid further reproach. I mean, who would believe her if she went around saying, hey, I'm pregnant? Yeah, probably not. Okay. And she's had to endure a lot. So she kept herself hidden. Until the pregnancy is indisputable. Possibly seclusion and prayer. I mean, this is her time, is it not? And possibly because Zachariah can't speak. So that would put her in the awkward position of telling everybody about this until it just becomes obvious. So she is hidden and we wait to see what the Lord will do. Well, the takeaway from this, I think it's easy to draw all kinds of applications and conclusions to say, well, you know, God didn't do anything. He's, guess what he's going to tell the Mary? What this is doing here is this is setting you up for the next appearance of Gable, who goes to Mary to talk about a conception. Because you thought this was impossible? And so when Gabriel speaks to Mary, he talks about the fact that, look, nothing is impossible with God. So we realize that and we take that from this story. But I think what I'd like to draw from this is that what we're seeing is that God is accomplishing his plan. And this, there's so many amazing things about this that <clears throat> this from heaven, from the court of heaven, an emissary appears speaking here in the language of the prophecy that was made 400 years earlier. And there's a lot of stuff that's been written and a lot of New Testament scholars these days are trying to figure out how does the New Testament connect to this stuff that was written in between because there's all kinds of stuff that was written, none of it's scripture. But what Heaven is saying is don't look at that stuff here. Go back here. Because we're going to pick up right there where it went silent. And we're going to move forward now in the plan and purpose of God. And when God does this, this world-changing thing that he's doing, he does it in a way. This is what I, I, I love about this. He does this in a way to bless a couple in their particular personal need. Isn't that amazing of God? I'm going to do this great thing, but in the process of doing it, I'm going to bless you. And so in the, the rest of their days, before they die, God gives them joy with this little one in their home. And God's going to take that little one and he's going to go on and do his plan with him. Well, we are at the end of our time. Next time, I think, you know, next time when we go on to talk about uh, the conception of Jesus, <clears throat> we'll have some time to reflect back on uh, some of the things that we've already seen here with John the Baptist. Well, let's pray together and we'll conclude today. Father, thank you for the scripture that you give to us and thank you for the amazing way in which you work your plan is sure even though centuries pass in our lifetimes but you work all things according to the purpose of your will and thank you lord the way in which you do this the lord that you hear and you care for us and our personal needs and grant blessings along the way. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.